a lot of it has to come down to our resilience factor. And so some level of pathogen exposure is actually really healthy for you. It's it's a hormetic stressor. It helps your body adapt, become stronger, more resilient. Your immune system gets more primed and healthier. However, if your body's already worn down, right? If you're being exposed to chronic toxicity, whether it's again heavy metals, mold, mycotoxins, um, you know, environmental toxins, whatever it is that's wearing your system down, you're under chronic stress then your resilience factor is low. So the tolerance point for you when it comes to exposure to these pathogens is very, very low, and it's easy to overshoot that and then develop some sort of chronic infection that um, that really takes you down even worse, right, even more. And so I think that's really the issue. So somebody that's, that's healthy, that is feeling really good and keeping their body um, really primed and doing all the right things that we talk about, getting regular sun exposure, exercise, sleeping, really prioritizing good sleep, keeping stress under control, eating a healthy diet can be exposed to a larger amount of pathogen and not have any sort of, you know, colonization take place because their body will just eliminate it um, on its own. Whereas somebody else that is living in a moldy home or that is going through a divorce or something along those lines they're not going to be able to handle that same pathogen load. And so now they're going to get the symptoms. I mean, you could have two, two people, even possibly in the same family, eat the same food, right? One person gets sick. The other person feels fine, right? No, no major issue. And we see that this kind of stuff all the time. Oh yeah, you're right. I mean, this is why a lot of marriages have been saved by me mm -hmm. because of the testing, because the wife gets blamed for being crazy and hormonal and no, she's full of mold. That's why she's irritable. Mm. And she's got low serotonin. That's why she can't sleep and why she's not as bubbly as she was when you married her because her neurotransmitters are low because she has gut infections screwing up her digestion. But the men trudge on like a foghorn. I'm fine. It's her, right? And so there's this big marriage conflict that happens. And so in those cases, if I know there's a relationship on the rocks, I say, look, get your husband on the call. I want him to hear this from me. Mm. I'll be the bad guy. You want me to tell him, hey, your wife's not crazy. You know, you need to be more supportive. So I've been fortunate to help many relationships like that in, in a functional medicine way because I'm showing on paper what's leading to the symptom, which is then causing the problem, right? Like, oh, she has no sex drive. You know, our marriage is dead. Because there's no libido. It's like, oh, well, I can show you why. Let me help yeah. you. Let me support you this way. Let me support her that way. Let's keep you guys together. And I really love doing that. I get a lot of joy out of that, even more so than just seeing a new test result that says we cleared the infection, knowing that we've been able to save a relationship and let's say prevent children from dealing with divorced parents. You know, that that's really rewarding for me. And you know, you made a comment about kind of like the the chronic stress bucket and what what's all in there. I mean I hate to tell you this, but you know it too. You know that this is the truth. In the last 10 years, it's gotten worse. It's gotten more intense. The smartphone addiction is out of control. Adults that are 40 and up weren't on social media that much 10 years ago. You know, we're talking what, 2013? That would have been a decade ago. I mean, it was kind of just the the youth that were really into these. And now, I mean, everywhere you go, I'll see people at the beach or in the most beautiful setting ever. And they're 55 and up, and they're both heads down scrolling on their phones on a bench at the park. And I'm like, oh, no, the social media virus has infected the older people, too. Holy crap. So what the, what does that mean for us? Are we all doomed? No, but what it means is you're going to have to be very intentional about putting your phone on airplane mode leaving it behind, or maybe if you're listening to our podcast, thanks for the support. But otherwise, you got to know when to tune out of this stuff because that's going to be waiting for you later. But if you don't prioritize you now and prioritize calming your system down and trying to self-regulate, you're going to develop problems. Our modern life is not compatible with our DNA and what our genetics expect. And what I mean by that is if you think of ancestral context of hanging out in a tribe. We were not isolated. We weren't just looking and communicating with a couple of people through the screen. We were in the same room, in the same circle. It was common for mothers to even uh, breastfeed other children. Like there was this maternal support that was massive. We had this, this tribe that we just no longer have anymore. It's a digital tribe now. It's a social tribe. So we lost that. Social isolation is equivalent to smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. We know that literature's out there. And we also had time to 
stargaze and we had time to look at the way the wind is blowing. The average hunter-gatherer worked about 18 hours a week, and now people are working more than that. So I'm not saying everyone can live the four-hour work week dream. Like, you know, it takes a special circumstance to be able to achieve something like that. But I think people need to be intentional about this downtime and recalibrating their nervous system because if you work all day, you come home, deal with your kids, cook dinner, sit on your phone till bedtime. Where was the time for you to regulate that nervous system? Where was that time for you to tell your body everything's okay? If you go from like eating dinner, having a stressful conversation about your bad day at work to then reading negative news to then trying to get restful sleep, that's not a good recipe for you. And I call this out. I know this is a diversion from the gut infection topic, but this is the everyday life that overall brings you down and makes you more susceptible. And I talk with people all day, every day. So I know this is not an uncommon story. This is like the average American now. It's, and, and they may even have the TV on too, blasting pharmaceutical ads in their face while they're scrolling. Like that's the commercial. So they hear that garbage, but then now they're scrolling and looking at other stuff and comparing themselves. And so they're jealous, they're envious, yeah. they're <laughs> You know, it's just, it, it's a toxic stew. I'm not saying you have to totally eliminate these things, but I think you got to be more aware of your use of them. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm right in alignment with you on that. And uh, last question, when you're going through your protocols, right, you're using the herbs to help bring down the infectious load. Are you also using stomach acid support, digestive enzymes? What are some other things that kind of complement what you're doing while you're bringing down uh, the pathogens? Yeah, I love it. Great question. So it depends on the symptom and it depends on the biomarkers. So on the GI map, if we're going to see that there's occult blood, there's some microscopic mm -hmm. bleeding happening, or we see there's elevated calprotectin, the gut's really inflamed, we may be cautious about using supplemental acids at first. Mm -hmm. We may come in with just some enzyme products with no HCL and then wait for the infection to be tamped down a little bit. We feel like inflammation's down, bleeding is down. Then I will love to throw in some extra acid. Saccharomyces boulardii, I do quite a bit of because that's helping as a gentle binder for mycotoxins. That's also helping in the fight against candida overgrowth. I will use like extended release, low histamine probiotics. I've got a blend that we've had for several years that's all low histamine strains because we talked about in the beginning how all these bacteria are producing more histamine and encouraging more of this histamine intolerance or even at the extreme, a mass cell activation problem. So we'll do those probiotics that helps reduce histamine. We'll do the Saccharomyces. We'll do the binders. I'm often doing some sort of liver and adrenal support. So this is usually a combo product, either capsules or tincture. We're helping with bile flow. So there may be supplemental ox bile in there. There may be taurine, methionine, some of these nutrients to encourage that flow of bile because mycotoxins hang out in the bile. So if we can get more bile flow, in theory, the binders will have more toxin to get access mm. to. So that may speed up the protocol. And then if there's mitochondrial damage, which there usually is in the case of mold toxin or chemical exposure, we're doing things there. So it could be carnitine, creatine, ribose, B vitamins, malic acid, CoQ10, things to help encourage mitochondrial ATP output. Because these people are so tired. If we want them to function, we've got to get them charge. So we're plugging them into the little battery pack to try to get them back up on their feet so they can be strong enough to live their life while doing the protocol. Um, there could be brain chemistry support there. If there's massive brain chemistry issues where they can't sleep, they're too anxious, they're having panic attacks, they're really depressed and apathetic, we may come in and boost them. We may do dephenylalanine. We may do some rhodiola to help give a natural antidepressant effect. We may throw in some Siberian ginseng to help them. If they're trying to get back into exercise, we may do cordyceps to encourage more oxygenation of the tissues. Uh, if there's Lyme and co-infections, we may bring Japanese knotweed in. We may do some atoba bark. We may do cat's claw. Uh, we like to do a lot of cryptolepis. That's a great herb that acts against SIBO, but it's awesome against Bartonella and Babesia, which I've dealt with those infections, unfortunately. So that's kind of the stew that we end up with. It's a combination yeah. of the brain, the adrenals, the liver, the digestive support, the enzymes, some of the probiotics. The binders are a big piece, though, that... Mm -hmm. Many people just, they, they're not consistent enough with them. Like I'll follow yeah. up with people. I'm like, hey, you keeping up with those little black capsules? Oh, I forgot. <laughs> it's like, well, you really need that because all this work upstream here is supporting you, but we got to get this, you know, this drain 
this this clog of toxins. We got to get this crap out of you. So um, I, I really have to hit people hard on the binder conversation. Mm -hmm.